Well, good morning, church family. So glad that you have come and spent some time with us, whether you're watching at 11.26 a.m. or you are engaged later on in the week. But uh, really, really thankful for the opportunity again to gather. And thank you, worship team. Thank you, Leslie, uh, for leading us. So good. I, I feel a little bit guilty some days that I get to be here and worship. It's like the worship service is kind of just for myself or a few of us, and I have all this room in which I can just pray and sing, and it's a real gift that way. So one day we will be back together, and that will be delightful for us. And so till then, we'll do it this way. And so I trust that in your homes or with your families or a roommate, um, or you're up at camp, I think Nathan said he was up at camp with some people today as well, or maybe you're camping and you got hit with a thunderstorm last night, Amazing! If you had the joy of being up early or you are a light sleeper and you woke up in the middle of the night to the storm, how could you not just declare like God's goodness and his power? And it's amazing. Like someone designed it and created it to be that way. And uh, what an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I happen to have an early cycle in my waking up time. And so I got to sit in the back and the, usually it's already bright by five o'clock. The sun is quite high already or coming up, but it was like pretty dark. And then there's a crack of lightning and thunder at the same time. And my puppy was having a hard time uh, resting on my lap because every time there'd be a boom, she would, she would look up and looking around, didn't know what was going on. I thought it was awesome, but she was in the safety and comfort of her owner, just like we can be with God. Okay. That's not how the analogy, but that is how this is. Well, today we are starting a new series. It's a series on the church. And uh, probably a pretty appropriate time in light of the things that are going on in our society these days. Um, there is a lot of things in regards to the church that are questions that one might have or one should probably be asking. And if you've been watching news, there would be one thing to look at. Um, you can see right now in the residential schools and the bodies that were found, like this is like, there's these devastating things that have gone on in our society that we've looked at and we've, we've put this picture together. We're like, is this what church is? Like, have man got it wrong? It's like Jesus started things off really in a, in a, in a quite a unique environment on how he began the gospel. They didn't even have these at that time. At best, a couple letters. Uh, they had some Jewish scriptures early on, some of the Older Testament. And yet, throughout this time, it's like we go on these like extremes either way. What balances us? What brings us back? Is Christianity what it has seemed to be? Has man taken over in places where God um, is supposed to be in control but not? Is church, is Christianity the way that maybe it happened? And again, thinking about uh, these, these bodies that were found, like is this, is this what church was intended to be, to take people and make them a certain way? Do we have to give up culture? Is the Western mindset of such that Christianity looks like just us, like what we have? What does the Bible actually teach? Because these things, there's atrocities in our history that need to be reconciled, at least in our inner person. They need to be reconciled. What do we do with this? What does the Bible teach? What is biblical church? What did God intend? What does this look like? I have so many questions, and today I'm going to start off with questions. What did Jesus intend for the church to look like? Are we doing it right right now? COVID brings up all sorts of questions. If we can't gather, what does that mean for the church? What, what means church? What means gathering? How many people do you need for it to be considered a church? How professional do people have to be? How much college training does one need? If Jesus lived today, how would he facilitate or operate or do church today? That's a question. These are things that I sort through almost every single day saying, God, what does this look like? What about programs in a church? What about paid staff or missions or elders or deacons? What about these things? What about hierarchy? What about leaders and bosses? What about these types of things? Is this part of the church? If you had never ever been to church before and you opened up your Bible and you just read it, what would it come out like at the end? Would you come out with what we're doing? Probably not the first few weeks, but what happens when a group of five 
all of a sudden grows to a group of 25. Does it turn into this then? Does it, does it not? Well, not today. Uh, but does it turn into this or does it, is it something else? Like what happens when we start or there's some ideals and then it moves somewhere? Like how do we deal with these types of things? What would it look like? What would we focus on? How would we know if a church is healthy? What is it supposed to be? How is it supposed to function? These are things that I sort through. I think we need to sort through and we will in this particular series. When I think about the early church, there's some serious things that come up, questions that need to be considered. So again, like I said at the beginning, they had some scripture, but not very much. A letter or two if you were lucky. Maybe at best as the church grew, you'd be able to take your Bible and you'd rip out a little section of it and that would be what you would have and you would carry it with you. And when you met another believer secretly, you would exchange your little passage or page or section of the scripture or the letter that you had. People didn't have the scriptures in their homes necessarily, each person having maybe a section of it, but maybe you had to gather and have someone read it to you if it was there. They didn't have programs or youth groups. Are those good? Are they not good? You didn't even necessarily have weekly gatherings. Sometimes you had daily gatherings. Sometimes you didn't have meetings at all, it seems to indicate in scripture. And yet in light of all of this, the gospel somehow spread all over the earth. That to me is phenomenal. How did it do that? How did it move forward from Jesus into all over the world? Like, if there's no hierarchy of figuring this thing out, how does it go there? Like, why did Anchor Point, like, why did we start? Like, why do we do this? Like, there isn't, there, there, there isn't an indicator that says, okay, this many people need to, and this many churches, and yet there's churches that are being planted, people that are being called. What does that mean? What does that look like? If any business person could capture the idea of what has gone on with the church, they would be very well off because somehow it continues to spread through thousands of years of history and it's still spreading today. And this message is going forth. How does it work? Why does it keep moving? Every single country, having started hospitals and schools, and yes, there's a track record that is not good and there's enough bad in that track record that should have wiped out any business model that did this. There's, a, there's enough bad in it that it should. And yet it didn't, and it moves forward. And these are questions that I'm perplexed by. It says in Acts 1.8, which is at the very beginning of this, the reason why it moved forward is because of the Holy Spirit and of power. And then people who've encountered the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, they become a witness to this power and this is how it begins to spread. What do we do with that? I think what the Western church would like to do is we take this and we create a beautiful theology on what does it really mean to have power and what is the Holy Spirit? And how does this work and how do we move forward? And instead of what it probably should lead us to is, oh God, fill me with your presence. Fill me with power that I would be a witness to actually knowing you and encountering you. I think that's actually the, the response that it should be. The early church, again, didn't have seminaries or Bible college or Google, and yet it exploded. So I don't want everything to go back to how the early church was. There was some warts in the history of the church going right back to the time of Jesus. There were some not so good things. But what are the things that are good and what are the things that are not so good? And how do we refocus on the areas that haven't been that great and over the last 15 months, there are things that we've become aware of that I didn't even know were questions I need to ask. And I think that is in part because until there is a form of trouble, you don't have to sort for answers, right? Until your family goes through tragedy, you don't have to deal with tragedy. It's hard to understand with what's going on in the world. Unless, unless it's impacted you, you don't really have this thing in which you have to wrestle but then when it, when it becomes personal, you have to wrestle, and COVID has done that. The questions that I've mentioned before is, are we hungry for God? Coming out of COVID, is that something that is going on? Is our spiritual dependence on if we can meet or not? These are questions. What do we love the most? What are we missing? Is there value to hugs and high fives? Um, is there spiritual significance to that? Why is it like that? Again, until you've lost someone or someone has passed away, you don't recognize what you maybe took for granted for so long. 
So, next week we're going to discuss what the church is. We're going to look the following week at what does it mean to be a Christian, and then we'll wrap up the series. Um, I think Daryl gave a phenomenal prelude to this with his Unity series the last two weeks. Um, tremendous. If you didn't have a chance to listen, you should go back. There's some really amazing things in there. So what have we learned? What are some of the values of Anchor Point, and what does that look like? I'm going to pray, and then we'll look into this. God, we desire to know your heart and your mind, what moves you, God. God, the church was your design. People knowing you, the living king. God, we get to start a series on discovering your bride, discovering the body of Christ. God, I think there's lots of us. We have all sorts of really great ideas about what it looks like. And it's not just mapped out super clear, do this, this, and this. And I think that's on purpose because there's something deeper than that that we're to capture and gather. Help me, God, with my words today. Jesus, would you be the one who speaks? God, if there's things that I say today that are not supposed to be heard or understood, I I pray that they would be removed, God, that people would not hear them. If there's things, God, that I need to speak today that I don't know I need to, oh, Holy Spirit, would you be the one who would teach and lead here? Thank you for this time. Amen. So we've learned some things on the negative that I don't want to get into today. We're going to focus on the values a little bit more. We've learned things like everyone wants to be right, (laughs) everyone likes to be in control, But that's not what we're going to look at. So who is the church for is the first question I want to ask. What does it mean to be the church? Who is it for? Is everyone welcome to gather? Is uh, is it like all people can come in and be a part of the church function this way? Or who is the church supposed to be for? This is a question that I got asked uh, several months ago. Donovan, who's the church for? And I just blurted out, it's for the hungry. I've said this a number of times, but it's for the hungry. And I started to think about this. If we would ask, what's the definition of church? It's a gathering of believers. But when we gather like this, are people not permitted to come who haven't surrendered their lives? Are they able to come if they are just curious, if they want to come in? Is it for people that want to come in and disrupt? Or is it for Satanists to be able to come in and find weaknesses and holes and try to tear down? And Scripture seems, in my perspective, seems to be seems to say that church or the meeting together of people are for those who are hungry. And I don't think it's limited to just those who are believers. I think it's limited to those that are hungry and seeking for what is true. The church is for hungry people pursuing truth and love. And I think it's in a place of not losing our wonder as we go along. I think wonder is what keeps us in a place of knowing that we're man and knowing that God is God. In the book of John, basically every chapter tells a story of someone who is hungry, which is why they met Jesus or encountered the truth. Starts in chapter 3, after we have uh, the the preamble of, of John's book, and we get to Nicodemus. He's a member of the Jewish ruling council, and he comes at nighttime. So he shouldn't have been really interested in this, but he comes at night, and he has this beautiful dialogue. And he says to Jesus, we know that you come from God because no one could do the miracles that you do unless they are from God. I think what an amazing hunger question. He's like, he's watching Jesus begin to operate. He's like, what is it about you? The rest of us religious leaders who have been in charge of helping people know God, here we have you and you come. Who are you? What is it about you? Hunger. I can't see it in a different way. He asks, how can I be born again? Do I like, my translation, do I climb back into my mother? That's impossible. And Jesus goes on to not give him all the answers, but give him enough that ends up leaving him in the state of like, I don't have all the answers, but I'm hungry. I'm guilty of sometimes giving too much, I think. But there's hunger that I see. Chapter four, you have a Samaritan woman at the well Jesus says, can you get me something to drink? And it's like, uh, kind of freaky here because I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew and I'm a woman and you're a man. You're not supposed to ask me. And Jesus is like, if you only knew who I was, you would ask me for living water that you would never thirst again. 
They have this beautiful exchange. You don't have a jug. How can you get me this different water? Uh, where is your husband? I don't have one. That's right. You have five. They have all these things that go on. And verse 25, to me, is a stunning verse that I've overlooked many, many a time. This Samaritan woman, she's not a Jewish woman. We don't know how much interaction, likely not a lot of interaction. How would she know the scriptures? And she says this, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. The Samaritan woman knows it. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. I'm like, ha! She knew that when God, the Messiah, was going to come, he was going to be able to explain all things. It wasn't like she was disqualified to God. She somehow already knew, and she's telling Jesus, the Son of God, who she doesn't know is the Son of God, saying, ah, one day we're going to get understanding, and it's going to all make sense. And then Jesus says something to her, it's, it's me. The Christ that you're looking for, it's me. And her whole world, I presume at that moment, flips on its head because now I know why a Jew would come and talk to a Samaritan. Now I know why a man would come and talk to a woman because the Messiah would be like that and something changes in her. I just see hunger. Man at the pool looking to be healed or the disciples and the feeding of the 5,000. People would go a full day out into the wilderness with not very much and apparently not food with their children, men, women, everyone for a day just to actually sit and hear this one Jesus who they did not know yet was the Messiah just to hear him speak. Hunger. This is what I see as an ingredient, a necessary ingredient and would be a value that we have at Anchor Point. Probably we would say a very core value. We feel like we don't need to micromanage and we don't need to dictate and we don't need to plan everyone's life um, if people are actually hungry. If it's not hunger and it's Donovan trying to corral groups of people into groups to make you feel like you're connected, probably is not going to be good. And we've tried that at some level. Sometimes it works. Often it doesn't. But it doesn't matter. If you put any people together that are hungry to grow, hungry to know truth, that group will always explode with glory and delight, I'm convinced. Now, when you add Jesus into that mix, it's another thing, and we'll get to that in a moment. This means that we take the steps or the stairs that Daryl was talking about the last couple of weeks, one step at a time. We walk our steps in our growth, and then we help others to take their steps, not our steps. Hunger, it means that we have a lack and we need some food, something that will nourish us. Hunger is not something that actually is satisfied for long. If we use the analogy, I need to eat many times a day because I get hungry, and this is something that I think we are to hunger for the Lord in this way. Hunger means that when someone is stuck and they can't take a step and they're struggling, we don't attack or judge, but what we do is we rather seek help or seek truth on their behalf so we can come alongside them and say, come, we hunger for knowledge and understanding and wisdom and help on their behalf because as the body of Christ, this is what we do. Hunger doesn't mean we have the answers, but it means that we know the one who does. So we actually know him, we actually know that he has the answers, and we desperately want to go to him. Hunger doesn't necessarily mean that you know God either, or that you have a relationship, but it's a posture of the heart. It's one that desires to not just go along with everyone and everything popular, but it's to seek out. Hunger. What I love about hunger is that hunger is something that at some level we can choose. You can choose what you're going to feed on and you can choose what you're going to hunger for. Um, I think that's a really incredible thing. I look at Nicodemus and it wasn't that he gave his life to follow Jesus at that point, but he didn't allow his pride to keep him from discovering who the Messiah was. Yes, he came at night, probably didn't want to get caught, but he needed to discover. Hunger does this. Hunger leads us in that way and I think it's a posture that is necessary. All right, hunger leads us to what? I think hun hunger leads us to godly motive. I say godly motive because uh, there's other motives that are in there as well. There's selfish motives and prideful motives. There's motives for pleasure. There's all sorts of things, but godly motives. And as we hunger and we encounter God or we know that he is truth, then actually he begins to do, when we surrender to him, he begins to do this transformative work inside because hunger eventually leads people to truth. Now, if you keep looking, that's what you're going to find. And then someone surrenders to him. So our motives begin to change. They become godly because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And the Bible teaches that it becomes Christ-likeness. This is what is supposed to happen. Now, 
If we don't have hunger, if we don't want to know God, if we're not seeking to know what's true, and we're trying to follow a religion and a set of rules, it actually won't work. This, this doesn't do it. And if we don't have th- this, the Spirit of God changing us on the inside, if this is not something that is happening on the inside, then we're going to fight theology and doctrine, and, and we're not going to actually arrive at knowledge of the truth. We're going to arrive at differing starting points that we can't even connect to. So what are the motives? The motives are the nature of God himself. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Godly motives cause us to become trustworthy. Become a safe place for people to ask questions. That They're not going to be attacked because if you're hungry, then you also know that other people are hungry and you're not trying to get them to something. You're trying to lead them somewhere. So someone who's hungry is going to be a safe place for people, other people that are hungry to ask questions. Godly motives means that there aren't hidden things in our agenda. We don't have an ulterior motive. And if we recognize that there's an ulterior motive, we actually want that to be exposed and to reveal it. Godly motive in relationships means that you are safe for someone to be real with. I think the idea of godly motives or godly character is likely one of the most significant themes throughout all of the New Testament in particular. Galatians 1.10 says this, and again, there's a hundred verses as I was looking through this week. Uh, there's so many I could choose, but here's just a splattering from a few different books. Galatians 1.10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's interesting. 1 Thessalonians 2.4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. I think that's a really interesting thing. Like God is testing and how interesting our motives that we can go about and we're fooling people perhaps with what our true motives are, right? Like sometimes it's hard to tell what someone's motive is as we're trying to have engagement or relationship with them. But God himself is doing a testing. I find that to be really fascinating. And if we know God, actually we're like, God, I want you to expose and I want you to test my heart. What is my motive? Because I want it pure before you. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's a good, that's a tough, that's a tough one to put others as more significant than yourself. Or 1 Timothy 1.5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and good conscience and a sincere faith. I love it that he puts these descriptors in there. It's not just issues from your heart, from your conscience, and from your faith. But he gives descriptors, a pure heart. This is the internal, the motive, a good conscience. Like We have to evaluate these things in a faith that is sincere. Mode of all the way through. Matthew 6, 1. This one is a tough one as well. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. <laughs> For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Yuck, right? Like, you want to talk like what happens in exposing in what's going on in COVID? It's like, you're not at church anymore and there's an evaluation that happens. It's like, at church I do this. I close my eyes. I put my hands up and I keep them shut and I keep them up because I want people to know I'm godly. That could be a motive that no one would know, right? Or I don't want to sit down. I really feel like I need to sit down during worship and just sit and just take it in. Ah, people are going to think I don't really love God. I don't this. It's like to please man instead of to please God. What is the motive? And the motive is important. And again, it's not that we, we don't have these other motives. It's Do we address them and God wants us to become Christ-like where our motive is one that is good and loving? At Anchor Point, we desire motive to be a very high priority. Why do we do the things that we do? We choose to be hungry for truth. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So in the yearning for truth, I think most people end up finding Jesus. When we surrender to him, Jesus changes us. Our motives are challenged, we begin to change, our purpose in life changes, etc. So, get hungry, grow in godly motives. I think it's sequential. And then we get to Jesus being a third value. You begin to discover, when you meet him and you encounter Jesus, you begin to discover that everything is about him. 
Everything is based around him. At Anchor Point, this is it. Jesus changes you. We repent. He transforms you. We have a new life that is in Christ. I've said a number of times that at Anchor Point, we don't want to be your Christian event planners. We do want to do events so people can meet each other, know each other, love each other, get together. When we open, we desire that because relationship is important. But we don't want to fill your calendar with must-dos or things you have to do. And we want you so busy at church that you can't actually love your neighbors or be in your community, be involved that way, bringing transformation. We don't want to be your spiritual cruise ship. I think that's one that Armand has used a few times. We don't want to be your cruise ship where you come in here and you, you lock in and you go along for the ride. You just buy the ticket by putting some money in a box or on the app so you don't feel as guilty and then we take care of you. We want to pastor God's church, Jesus' church, and we want to do that with you where we are growing to care for, love, grow to know God together. We want to help inspire you to love God wholeheartedly and to love each other wholeheartedly. I use the word wholehearted. I'm just captured as I wrote it in here. Wholehearted as in the motive once again, right? We, we want it to be a pure loving of God and of each other. We want to help teach you how to minister to each other, how to pastor, how to, how to love. How do you love those that are hard to love? How do you love your family or friends or your neighbors? And, and how do we lead our children and train them? And we want to help in the attempting to equip and help you to learn how and to do this together and come alongside. At Anchor Point, everything, puts, we put our attention, everything back on the Jesus. It says in Scripture that Jesus is the head of the church says in scripture, he's the one to lead it. We want him to be the one, really and honestly. If you come and if you're in here when we're having our meetings, we come before the Lord and we wait upon him and we listen to him and we stop and we open the scriptures and we share the things that we sense God is saying and we wait until we're unified and we don't wanna make a move on something unless we're unified together because the spirit unifies, but we want it to be about Jesus. I tell you in the face of COVID, that has been a, a high challenge. It's a challenge because there's so many voices and demands when things don't go the way that you want. It's like, Jesus, what do you say? We need to know what you say because we don't want to just please man. God, we want to please you. We desire that people who come to Anchor Point, you would not just have your heart to be soil that is like rocky where a seed goes and you grow for a moment and then it just disappears or you come and you love God for a year and then you, you don't. We want long lasting. We want you to have profound encounters. We want you to genuinely have been impacted by Jesus and his people. And we don't want it to be a one-off. We don't want you to come to a great worship and prayer night and meet God and then you leave and then you never meet him again and for the rest of your days you tell the story of having met God once. That's not what we want. We want it over and over and over, being enamored by his spirit, by people, by meeting in a group with a large group, by yourself, alone with him and having encounters over and over and over again. I think this is a place that the church has probably failed because we've made it very centric around get together and this is where you experience or you meet God. And we don't want it to be that way. We want Jesus to be the one that you encounter over and over by yourself with a few people in your families. Um, together in a large group, it doesn't really matter. We don't ever want to become a cruise ship, a place to coast along, a place where you can pretend to be alive, but in essence inside you're dead or it's not active inside. No, we want Jesus together forever, right? To follow him is eternal life, right? So it's like this is an eternal thing that we want people to encounter him, surrender to him, know him, fall in love with him, and it's forever. Like it's to go on forever. And Jesus is like, come to my cabin. It's called heaven. You can spend eternity with me here forever if you give your life to me. We desire to see miracles and transformation and hope and prophecy. Lives changed and homes changed. This week on Zoom, we had a prayer meeting and we were praying about the church. And um, we were listening, just six of us here from the church praying together. And uh, there was a, a, I'm often praying, but 
There's a few times when God speaks really clearly. And this particular time, just in this group, I was like, I, I got really excited because what he, what he shared was so clear and really exciting. And I just saw like the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf on the path, and he's like, you shall not pass. And he like, I don't know, throws his staff down or whatever. I saw like Jesus with a sword and he throws it into the, puts it in the ground. And I, I sense he's saying, enough. And he like throws it. And I'm like, oh, he must not be happy because that's not very good. But he was really happy. It wasn't an enough and that's it. It's like he wasn't angry. He was just saying, Donovan, all, all throughout the nation, I am drawing churches in the same way that I'm drawing yours. There's questions being asked all across the nation. I am doing a supernatural work, turning the eyes back. And now the nation is ready. They've done it a long time on their own, their own way. And the nation is far enough down this road to go, we don't know how to do it. We are not good at doing church. We've kind of sucked it up pretty bad, right? And Jesus is like, enough. And he goes, now my church is ready to get their eyes back on me. It's a supernatural event. All about Jesus, doing his work, drawing us to himself. It's not about Anchor Point. It's not about Church of the Rock or the MBs, the Catholic or the Lutheran. It's not like that. It's are there people, pastors, churches that are hungry saying, God, we want to know you. And a supernatural move of God sweeping through the land. It's not something we can muster up. It's not something you can just do God saying, now you've gone far enough. Right now you're ready for a king. Now you're ready for me to be Lord. Now. And I can look and I can easily get into my own head and say, God, like this is not good. Satan has done all sorts of wicked things. And he's like, Donovan, do you not see? Now it's enough. I I have now said it's enough. Now I'm drawing my people back to me. Jesus, that is a value for us. He gets the glory. We're all equal before him. He gets the glory. Fourth value that I want to touch on. Every individual matters and is worth investing into. God's grace extends to everyone. It's not limited to a certain number Jesus wants that none would perish and all would come into relationship with him. We believe in the long haul in walking with people. We don't want to go down the road of just the flash in the pan or a big revival meeting and that's the extent of it. We, we want to walk with people now all the way through into eternity. This is something that's important because every person is important to God. I think the church has got really good on the business aspect of things in marketing over the years. And we're going to get, it's not just finding the broken and the hurting and the lonely and, and those that are in need of a savior. It's how do we get more butts in the seat, more dollars in the account, so that that would be the sign that we're doing awesome. No, that is not what we want. Walking with people. You get nothing in return because everyone is of value. All are equal. All made in the image of God. All have value. All are worth investing into. But hear me right. It comes in this order. Motive is still important. Jesus still needs to be leading. I'm not saying if you're in a relationship or a friendship or something that is abusive that you just stay in it and you get trampled on it. I don't mean like that. Jesus demonstrated what it was like to love abusers. Right? He gets the mind of God and he's getting abused. He had a whole day of torture to the point of death and he's on the cross and he didn't spend time with them but his heart was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like How, after he'd been tortured but he had the mind and the heart of God, his Father, he had his mind for this thing. I don't mean by everyone has value in that you, you stay in relationships that are close where you just keep getting hurt but actually to come and say, God, how do you see? God, what is going on? Jesus, what do you have for me? What do I need to do? What does it look like? Where do I go next to God? Sometimes it's the secret place. Sometimes it's you enter into relationship, but God, if he asks you to do something, will give you everything you need to walk it through. So I don't mean you just stay in it and we just get trampled, but I also don't mean how the world has done it again or the church has done it. Now we put parameters or we put boundaries, and this has become the big thing. Put boundaries on everything to eliminate so we don't have to have any pain in our lives. No, no, no. God, what do you see? 
God, what do you see? Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you love them. Every person has value. I like what Paul says in Galatians 3.26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this is stunning because it's like it's not even like you are all individuals in this body, which we are individuals, but you are all one in him. Like in Christ, we are all one. We've made it in the church, I think often like a multi-level marketing scheme. I am to blame for this too. It's like, I'm going to lead these ones who will lead these ones who will lead these ones and this is how it will go forth. Um, perhaps not. Perhaps we are all equal at the cross and maybe when we have such a hierarchy structure, what ends up happening is pride can creep in. I got this and you need to do what I say and submit to your leader so I tell you what to do and you and how this works and now I have to dictate your world. Bad. We are all one. One body at the cross, all equal before him. And it's not a scheme where we eliminate God. It's actually God working with each individual because you and 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 you all have value, equal value. Every person is worth walking with. There is no preference. It's not I am in Middle class, therefore I need to spend time with middle, upper class people because I am a really big deal and I am important and I need to advance this way. And I, No, it's opposite. It's like we look for those who hurt and are alone and we say, come on, and we give extraordinary love because it's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. I love the testimonies that I've often heard from this church. People have said, I can't believe it, I come and people actually want to know me. Best testimony I can ever have is that. I come in and people actually want to know who I am. People cared. I heard one time, I came to church first time and someone invited me to their house for lunch first time I came. I'm like, ooh, that doesn't happen very often, I don't think, but that's really great. Your heart like leaps inside. You're like, yes, the body of Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. We are one together, equal before the cross. This is who we are. We have lots of demographics in our church. I love it that there's so many. My brother told me one day, Donovan, if you ever move to a different building, make sure you keep a bus route close to you. Not everyone has a car. And I went, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, like, if the church is for all, you better have access for all. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's really important. I can go buy some land out in, by your farm, <laughs> right? We can, we can go do that, but it's like, no, th then you've just eliminated a certain number of people who can't come. And I'm like, okay, God, yes, we always want to have a way in which all are able to come. That's amazing, isn't it? So you get these little nuggets and every person of value there was a time where it was like we, we just ostracized certain groups of people and we were like, we, the church in general. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's too much work to kind of reach into that group because actually there's so many, we need to just get as many as possible to get them saved. So we just, we, not them, not them, not them, not them, just the masses, just kind of this middle group. No, no, all. And that's why we all have a role to play because there's, we have spheres in which we get to go and love and care for people um, that isn't just the mass. It's like individual people that God cares about deeply. And your call may be one of those. Just one. That would be a noble cause. If every Christian led one and discipled one to maturity in their lifetime, just one. Just one. Come on. Let me in, come with me. Let me introduce you. And you walked with one, the world would change. There's an estimation that there's billions of people that call themselves Christians in the world. What if there's half, half a billion only that really loved God? Half a billion and then in our lifetime we double that? That would be an amazing return. So we become hungry. We surrender our lives to Jesus. Start having faith in. We put our eyes on the kingdom, everything Jesus. Then we begin to value the things that he does. So then we get to, we want to encourage 
something. And I think, again, it's in this order. This is something that I've learned over COVID. We want to encourage and model having an open, honest dialogue. This is what we desire. We don't want to be the, the ones who have all the truth. There was a time throughout history that this began to shift. And when the printing press was made, the Bible became accessible to people. Right? So everyone got to have it. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Now, not everyone had it in their home, but it became accessible. And you didn't need the priest or the pope or the pastor or whoever to be the one telling you everything. Now people could start to get scripture. And as that progressed, there got to be a stage where scholarly work and the best research and looking into the, the origin and the history of scripture, the best way to do that would be to go to a seminary and you could have all the best writers stuff and only those that committed their lives to the pastorate could go and have access to this stuff. That's all changed. It's all changed since the year 2000-ish. Now we all have access. In fact, you have equal access and far smarter in many, many areas because I can never dig into the amount to dig into this, to understand and know. And you all have access to the Hebrew, to the Greek, to the Aramaic, to the history of the language, how it works, how does it develop. What is, everyone, we're all, it's like, we can look at it and say it's bad. It's so good in my opinion because we're on an equal playing field. Even in the area of knowledge, exploration and wonder together, we're at an equal playing field. I think that is a really good thing. So how then can we as a church encourage open and honest dialogue in love without sacrificing what's true? That is hard work. I'm telling you, it's something I'm working on. It is hard to do that and so important if we can discover. The problem sometimes is, is that before we've encountered God, before we've surrendered to him, before we love him, or the elementary teachings of the gospel. We go into the meaty things, but we don't have the heart after the Lord or the seeking for what's true. So we fight on things, but again, we start from two different playing fields where the motive is not necessarily to know what's true. At Anchor Point, we desire to have the open dialogue, but the open dialogue doesn't take precedent over knowing God, growing to love him, loving the body, having unity, but these work together to cause us those things as well. It's tough. When the motives are off, selfishness and pride can creep in easily. Sometimes we don't know what someone's motive is and it's hard to wrestle through. Like, what do you actually feel and what do you think? But this deep relationship becomes so critical, but it has to be done in love. And finally, we want to be a church that actually builds partnerships or builds bridges between different groups of Christian faith as well. We don't believe that theology should be the thing that separates us. We believe that unity is of the highest call. We want to get excited about our brothers and sisters that do things differently than us. We want to learn from them and we want to grow together towards Jesus. I don't think Jesus seemed to be very bothered by this idea. Uh, he didn't mind if different groups, he's like, yeah, if the gospel's preached, the gospel's preached, that's fantastic, I love it. And he seems to have this attitude all the way through. And so... If we have faith in Jesus, you are called a child of God, and then we are part of one faith and one church and one baptism, one Lord and one Savior overall. If you look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, it says this at the beginning. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Whew. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Everyone, part of the family of God, through faith, working together on the same team, we become part of the same family through Jesus. This has been a stain one of the stains in the Christian church is the separation and division and disunity over any little thing. And it works if you don't fight for unity, relationship, love, depth of care, 
these things. If you don't fight for this, it's way easier to just put a parameter in place and separate so we can just keep in our own little world. It takes so much work to want to know each other, love each other, and come together and have the bond of peace, unity through the bond of peace. And it's so beautiful. This passage really articulates what I'm trying to say in this message. And then at the end of it, it's like, and he gives gifts to the people. It's like I took them, he left, he's gonna be in all, through all, Jesus. He had to ascend so he could be in everything. And he says, I give you all gifts, different gifts, different ones. Believers in different denominations, they have gifts too. This, my friends, is how I wanted to start off the message series on the church. At the very heart of it, if these are the things, I think many of the atrocities that have gone on in the world, if we actually believed or wanted to know what each other's motives were, had a, a relationship like that where I want to understand you and get you and fathom what's going on and why do you think this and what does it look like? If that was something more that drove us instead of just mission, I think mission can get us looking off on a weird, weird road sometimes. It's like, no, I just have a mission and this is all I'm doing. You can't even hear anything else because you just have to get to the end. That's not what we want to do at Anchor Point. So this is how I want to end. And I want to pray for you. So, God, would you cause in us who are listening today to have ears to hear what the Spirit says? God, for, for those of us who have attended church and maybe in our attending, we've never really hungered for you. God, would you help us to hunger God, would you bring about questions in our minds and hearts that would cause us to hunger after you, to want to know you, to understand you? God, would you give us questions that are just not satisfied with just a quick answer, but, but questions that would cause us to desire to know the living King? God, I pray that in the discovery of truth that we would find you, Jesus, that you would transform us on the inside, God, Acts 1.8, I want to pray for the church today that we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, that you would come upon us, God, that we'd be a witness to the relationship that we tangibly have with you. God, we want to meet you over and over and over again. God, help us to love the differences that we have. Help us, God, to get fascinated with how different you made different people. Even in the pre-chat, when we're talking about introverts and extroverts, God, would we be fascinated by the differences, fascinated by the different callings, fascinated, God, by the different gifts that you give us, the different purposes that we have, but all of it coming back to you, Jesus, are the head, and we want to follow, obey, listen, know you, all for your glory, your purpose. God, would your kingdom go forth, not ours. Would your name go forth, not ours? God, would we get out of the way? Would we trust when you say, enough? Now I'm gonna bring people. Now they know that I, they need me. God, we need you. We desperately need you. God, I pray for the hurting and the broken in particular with what's going on in Kamloops, God. God, the brokenness. Jesus, there needs to be a true church that is truly submitted to you, that truly loves you, that loves the way that you do, God, so we can listen and truly reconcile. God, one of the jobs is to reconcile people back to you, but it's you, it's not not an institution, it's you, God, that we're reconciling people back to. The creator, the creative one, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. Change us, God, and transform us into your likeness, I pray in Jesus' holy name, amen.